Hey, what is up everybody? Welcome back to the Hacksmitter Twitch channel, or if you're watching this after the fact, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Tyler Ramsby, and we get to hang out this evening. Had some uh, technical difficulties in the beginning of the stream. Both me and Callie Max have just had weird issues with the Try Hack Me AWS environment, but I think everything is working now. So before it breaks, we are just gonna dive right into it and continue working through the attacking and defending AWS pathway. My goal is to get every covered mo every module covered between me and Cali Max. That being said, that is as long as it doesn't become buggy. If it gets too frustrating for me, I'm gonna jump and do something else. But so far, at least for this evening, it seems to be working. Let me just show you guys uh, where we're at. We will go over to attacking and defending AWS. And here's what we've covered. We covered all of intro, all of intro to I am, and then we are currently in attacking and defending core services. And we're gonna dive right into AWS VPC attack and defense. We're gonna learn the basics of AWS virtual private cloud. And as usual, I will read everything in its entirety so that you guys get all of this content for yourselves. Here's try hack me. Here is my AWS environment generated by them. That was broken, but seems to be working now, even though uh, those who were on Twitch saw the error message saying, hey, the environment's still broken, reset again. I've already had a reset at once, but I don't know, seems to be working. Our AWS Virtual Private Cloud is a software-defined network construct in your AWS account. It logically separates your network traffic from the network traffic of other AWS customers. Customers can define their side ranges, connect their VPCs, or connect their VPCs to their on-prem networks. AWS VPCs are a regional construct. You need to create a VPC in every region you want to deploy VPC-based workloads. By default, when a new AWS account is created, default VPCs are deployed in all the standard regions. Each of these VPCs uses the same 172 31.0.016 CIDR range. VPCs you create can use any CIDR range. You're not limited to RFC 1918 CIDR ranges. You can see your VPCs on the VPC dashboard. So let's go ahead and go there. Here is, I believe, the VPC dashboard. So we have this VPC room, uh, VPC. The dashboard is helpful because it allows you to view VPC activity across all regions. And VPCs have a VPC ID that begins with the VPC, which we can see that there. The VPC ID is unique across all of AWS. VPC IDs used to be eight characters long, but in 2018, AWS extended them to be 17 characters long. You can tell older VPCs by short identifier. Networking in a VPC is different from networking in an on-prem environment. Because of the software-defined and multi-tenant nature of the public cloud, VPCs don't need things like ARP to discover where the network devices reside. ARP tables are visible for compatibility with the OS's networking stack, but typical attack techniques like ARP spoofing will not work in a VPC environment. If you haven't already done so, click the orange cloud details button. I did it twice <laughs> uh, at the right of the page. Generate the cloud environment and use the creds to access our sandbox, which we have. Go to the council, have a look around. All resources are deployed in US East 1. Um, whoa, 619 people. Yo, that's crazy. What's up, everybody? We are working through the uh, attacking and defending AWS pathway by by try hack me so thank you guys for hanging out this is a business exclusive pathway but i received access for one month to stream the content so we are uh we are diving into things so appreciate it from all of you rating feel free to hang around and learn aws pen testing with me all right global listing oh man Global listings of all VPCs. Note for all the Try Hack Me labs, and here's our attack box, here's our council. We'll be using US East, also known as US East 1. What is the side range of the VPC name VPC room? All right, so the questions begin uh, pretty basic, so we'll go ahead and do that. And I, I just need to get, <laughs> hold up guys. Insane. Uh, I don't know where y'all came from, but Appreciate you being here. Usually I have like 25 people uh, watching me. So thank you guys for hanging out. It, it's crazy to have, have you all here. We came from the Primogen Hack Smarter. Sweet. Awesome. The voice is amazing. Well, I, I appreciate that you guys like my voice. <laughs> thank you. So usually I, I'll just give a quick introduction to kind of this channel. And if I can, uh, I'm going to drop my YouTube link in the chat 
all my videos get posted on YouTube. Uh, generally, what I do, guys, is I just dive into a random hack the box machine or a try hack me machine. We go into it blind and we use Cali and see what we are able to do and kind of work through it together. I post all my videos afterwards on my YouTube channel. My Twitch, none of my videos on Twitch stay because Twitch doesn't like my copyrighted music, um, but they are on YouTube. So I would encourage you to find me on YouTube. Uh, but what I'm doing now is a little bit different than what I usually do. I'm going through the eight attacking and defending AWS pathway and try hack me. So less like hacky of just diving into a box and figuring it out and more of following uh, the tutorial. And because this is a very limited access for many people, I'm reading everything in its entirety so that those without access to this pathway can still learn from it. So um, that is what we are doing. So let's keep going. Uh, so really though, jokes aside, why Windows right now looks like a daily driver and need it for recording. The only reason I'm using Windows is once again, because I'm using this uh, try hack me pathway. Generally, when you find me streaming, I'll either be using Kali Linux or Parrot OS, uh, but right now it's Windows. And is it my daily driver? It is my daily driver. And the reason for that is I game. Uh, actually, I ran Ubuntu for quite a while. And even with like the NVIDIA stuff that you can get on Ubuntu that's open source, it just didn't work very well with gaming. And so uh, I got a sweet gaming computer and all the games work better on Windows. So my host OS is Windows. But whenever I'm doing this kind of stuff, usually I'm in Kali, but because of the way this pathway is set up, I do have to use my base system in order to go through and stream stuff. Hope that makes sense. All right, I was distracted now by, by all of this. Did I answer this question? Yeah, okay, sweet. <laughs> Access in the environment, we already did that. AZ subnets and route tables, oh my. All right, VPCs consist of subnets and each subnet exists only in one availability zone. Subnets must use CIDR ranges that are subsets of the VPC CIDR range and subnet CIDR ranges can't overlap. Every VPC has a VPC router per AWS's documentation. So your VPC has an implicit router, blah, blah. That's just from their documentation. You can pause the video and read that if you'd like. VPCs have two special route destinations, internet gateway and virtual private gateway. The IGW is the endpoint that acts as the border between the VPC and the internet. The VGW is the endpoint that acts as a border between the VPC and the on-prem networks. You may hear the phrase public subnet or private subnet concerning VPC subnets. No AWS attribute explicitly defines a subnet as a public or private subnet. The only thing that makes the subnet public is how the route table sends traffic to the internet. If a subnet has a direct route to the IGW, it is public and any resource in that subnet with a public IP address is accessible from the internet. If there is no public IP address and no route to the IGW, the subnet can be reasonably considered private. While a subnet could be configured to automatically assign a public IP address to EC2 instances in the subnet, without a route to the IGW, that instance is not reachable from the internet. Okay, a little like Yoda phrasing there, but I, I think I understand it. As an attacker, you can modify the route table to make a subnet route to the IGW and bypass some or all of the security controls. He who controls the IAM controls the network, whoever that is. So whoops, let's look at this diagram here so we understand a little bit of what is going on. So we have our VPC right here, and within our VPC, we have two AZs or two availability zones. We have this public subnet, private subnet, public subnet two, private subnet two, internet gateway, and then we have some just how everything's set up with CloudWatch logs and Amazon S3 and uh, all of that stuff. Gosh, guys, I can't keep up with the chat, y'all. Like I told you, usually I got 20 people. I don't know what y'all are, are chatting. Let me see if I can answer some of the questions over here. Uh, let's see if actually useful don't work in WSL. Oh, yeah, so I also, I also use WSL uh, for work. So I work at uh, Rhino Security Labs. I'm a web app pen tester. Uh, I do like external network pen tests and APIs, but mainly web app pen testing. And on that, I also run host uh, windows because that's what we use. But a lot of my stuff is VMs, but often I use WSL for Kali just because I'm often just using command line tools on there. And then Burp Suite Pro is kind of where I spend most of my day living. As a non AWS user, getting strong OpenStack vibes from the explanations. Yeah, and uh, like just so no one is confused, I'm pretty dang new with AWS. 
So AWS is, is relatively new to me. I'm still an AWS noob, so I'm kind of learning as I work these work through these things. All right, let's keep going. AWS offers something called managed NAT gateways. These are EC2 instances run by AWS that provide NAT capabilities to allow private subnets to access the internet. You would typically configure your private subnet to route to that destination to the NAT gateway, while you configure the route table of a public subnet to route there to the IGW directly. For the above diagram, so this diagram right here, your route tables might look like this. Our public table, we have our CIDR range right there, which would be local and then IGW, so kind of like your gateway right there. The private route table AZA, so that's availability zone A right there. We have the local, the NAT gateway, and then that gateway, and then very similar thing for availability zone B. In the public subnets, all I'm glad you didn't find anything, Windows Security. Guys, I do have a sweet AV bypass I wrote. I'm not going to show it to you on stream because I'm writing a blog about it, but I'm able to generate an EXE that gets a full reverse shell that bypasses uh, everything, at least everything I can see. I don't think it would bypass an EDR, but it fully bypasses updated Defender. So I'm glad Defender didn't find anything because it could have found my exploit. In the public subnets, all internet facing traffic goes to the IGW and the internet. For the two private subnets, traffic destined to the internet will go to the NAT gateway in that AZ or availability zone. There's also a route to the on-prem corporate network that points to the VGW. We'll discuss how on-prem networks talk to VPC in a future room. Someone said I ignored your question. What was your question? Do AWS keep their exploits open for educational purposes? I don't think I understand your question. Um, no. So like if there's an exploit in AWS, they're not going to keep it open. Bottleneck said a good amount of AWS exploits are incorrect configuration. Yeah, absolutely. Plus these systems are very complex. So even as you, even as we read through this guys, like it's confusing. So you can imagine being a system admin or a cloud admin when you're configuring these things, you make one mistake, right? It's not an exploit. It's not like a a zero day, but it's a misconfiguration. And what you'll learn about security is many security flaws, many ways an attacker gets into a system are misconfigurations or often humans. Humans are, are the weakest link. And yeah, Attachi said also S3 bucket policies. My previous stream, which you can find on my YouTube, we did a full uh, S3 bucket lab where we exploited a misconfigured S3 bucket to get some data. We restored an EC2 from backup and then found credentials that way. So absolutely. Okay, for the VPC in your account, the private subnets have a route to a fictional on-prem network via a VGW. What is the CIDR range of the fictional on-prem network? Okay, for the VPC in my account, which I only have one VPC, right? If we go to CIDRs, uh, I don't know if I understand this question. Do you guys understand the question? Let's click Let's click around and see if we can figure it out. Maybe it's in the main route table. And maybe it's broken as well. Some of you missed this, but when I launched this uh, network, everything was broken and it also told me it was broken. So I don't actually know what what might be broken with this and what might actually be working. So there's a chance if we can't find something, it's because it's it's broken, which would be frustrating. Okay, hold up. We have some stuff here. Oh, this is just all traffic. For the VPC in your account, the private subnets, what's the hint? Check the route table associated to your VPC. Isn't that what I checked, yo? About to switch over to hack the box. Uh, let's see. Let me just close all this stuff. I thought I opened the route table. And I didn't see anything. Let's click your VPC. So here's our uh, VPC room here. Here's our main route table. Isn't that what it's telling me to check? Check the route tables associated with your VPC. This is my VPC. This is my root route table. Okay. Here's my route table ID. We have this, of course, but that is not... For the VPC in your account, the private subnets have a route to a fictional on-prem network via a VGW. What is the CIDR range of the fictional on-prem network? I don't know. I'm just going to open all these so I find the right answer. 
Is it right here? No. Freaking, I don't even know. Check private subnets route table. Let's just check subnets. Oh, look at this. We have some subnets here. So now we have a few different subnets. So we have VPC room public, VPC private, VPC private, and VPC room public in different availability zones, right? So the A is an availability zone in US East 1. The Bs are availability zones in US East 1. So for the VPC in your account, the private subnets, so that would be both of these private subnets have a route to a fictional on-prem. Okay. So if I open these private subnets, let me just close all these extra tabs. Here's a private subnet. And then, do we need to check this route table? Ah, I bet it's this one. Hey, I got it. NACLs and security groups. Network access control list or NACLs are the one VPC firewall construct AWS provides. NACLs apply to subnets. They are stateless in that both the initial or inbound connection and the return or outbound traffic must be authorized. NACLs support either allow or deny actions and the actions are evaluated in a specific order. Unlike IAM, an explicit deny does not override an explicit allow. Okay, we need to keep that in mind. That would be like if this is a teacher, they would say, hey, this is going to be on the quiz. Instead, rules are processed in order until a match is made. By default, NACLs have a deny all rule. So let's see if we can understand this. Uh, so here's our network ACL, subnet one network ACL for that. A route table, virtual private gateway. Well, this doesn't have any rules here. Hold up. Here you can see how an NAC how an NACL is configured in AWS Council. In this specific case, the NACL prohibits all SSH traffic. Right? So we can see that deny from anywhere on that range, then allows all other traffic. Okay, so it says, hey, all other traffic, go ahead and allow. And then the final deny rule is a default from AWS. Okay, got it. So I'm assuming the way this would work is it allow all traffic except for SSH, right? Because NACLs are applied to an entire subnet, they have a high blast radius if misconfigured. So we've been talking in the chat, some of y'all have been talking about misconfigurations, and there you go. For that reason, they're used less frequently than the other forms of network access control, which is security groups. Sometimes, a central network security team will configure NACLs for services they want to block with no exceptions. Security groups are attached to specific resources such as EC2 instances or RDS databases. Security groups only support allow. Security groups are stateful and have different rule sets for ingress or inbound and egress or outbound. Okay, so here's an example of our sample security group. We have a description, email processing security group, and then let's see, let's just read this. So we have an inbound rule, inbound rule SMTP, so email, on port 25 from the source anywhere to anywhere, and that's going to allow inbound email. We have SSH on the port 22, which only allows my IP. So only this IP right here would be able to SSH in here, allow administration, and then pop three. Uh, we have custom, and then we are using SG, which would be a security group. Only the processing server can fetch email. So we're applying it a rule from a security group. And then outbound rules allow traffic. So that just means we can go anywhere outbound. Security groups are the primary way network level access is managed for resources. Security groups can reference either a CIDR range as a source or another security group ID. If a security group is referenced, any ENI with that security group attached is a valid source for the traffic. The following table provided by AWS summarizes the difference between security groups and NACLs. All right, so security groups operates at the instance level, right? Think EC2 databases. ACL operates at the subnet level, so much more on the networking side of things. Security group supports allow rules only. ACL supports allow and deny rules. Security group is stateful. Return traffic is automatically allowed regardless of any rules. ACL is stateless. Return traffic must be explicitly allowed by rules. 
Uh, here we evaluate all rules before deciding whether to allow traffic. We process rules in order, starting with the lowest numbered rule when deciding whether to allow traffic. And this applies to an instance only, only if someone specifies a security group when launching the instance or associates a security group with the instance later on. This automatically applies to all instances in the subnets that's associated with. Therefore, it provides an additional layer of defense that the security group rules are too permissive, right? The whole concept of security in defense or defense in layers. What side range in the security group VPC room instances is allowed to SSH? So if we go to, I think it's just this one. No, what side range in the security group VPC room instances? So we need to go to security groups. If we just go back out to home here, we can start typing security groups. Maybe. Uh, is it is it still VPC? Let's check. Here we go. Security groups. And which room are we talking about? VPC room instances. So we'll click that one. And we can see this right here. Whoops. Don't want to mark it. If I scroll over here, we say, hey, okay, we have this security group right here. It allows SSH on port 22 from this specific IP address. So let's go ahead and grab that and drop it there. What port range is permitted to the private subnets from the on-prem network range? What port range is permitted to the private subnets from the on-prem network range? So if we go back to that on-prem network range, it was any of the private subnets, right? Uh, had that access, let's go round table. we go to this, I have no idea if I'm doing this right. No, nope, I'm not doing it right. Hooter has said, I know this is a weird first message, but your mic is doing weird sounds when you say P, 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 P. <laughs> and now back to lurking and learning AWS. Thank you for the serum, people coop. It may just be, you know, like my mic should technically have a uh, pop filter, which it's kind of weird that P is in that. And I don't have the pop filter on it because then you can't see me. Maybe if I just move it away, let me know if that's a little bit better. Anyways, what port range is permitted to the private subnets from the on-prem network range? I don't know. Uh, let's look at network ACLs. Okay. Can we look at the ID here? So what port range is permitted the private subnets from the on-prem network range? Is it this? Maybe take away the spaces. Hey, what was the hint? Look at the VPC room private subnet in ACL. Don't include spaces in the answer. All right, beautiful. What services are inside of VPC or outside of VPC? All right, let's find out. An essential concept in defending your AWS environment is knowing what resources reside inside a VPC and which ones are outside the VPC. EC2 instances, RDS databases, and big data things like Redshift are all examples of services that exist inside a VPC. Whereas S3 buckets, the AWS NoSQL database, DynamoDB, exist outside the VPC. All right, got it. So this is the same image we had before, but just showing, hey, what exists inside RDS, EC2, RDS, EC2, and what exists outside? And we have a few things outside. Resources inside a VPC can be protected by via NACLs and security groups, and you can prevent anyone from having direct access to them. Resources outside the VPC are protected only by IAM. So remember, IAM is like the identity and access management, kind of like the users and permissions that go with the users. Every resource inside the VPC has an elastic network interface or an ENI. ENIs are virtual network cards that are part of your VPC. ENIs can be attached to an instance, detached and moved to another instance. Often, this is done to facilitate high availability failover. ENIs represent a DHCP lease from the VPC's DHCP server. ENIs can also have a public IPv4 address if configured as such. 
ENIs are tied to a specific subnet and can bridge an EC2 instance across two subnets, but only in the same availability zone. It is the ENI that security groups are attached to. You can get a holistic view of resources in a VPC by listing all of the ENIs in an account. You can also use the EC2 console or the AWS CLI command via AWS Cloud Shell. And let's go ahead and break out actually our AWS CLI. And uh, usually I'll just sh like show the creds because there's like 15 people on here, but uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna show you guys the creds for TriHackMe's AWS environment. So you're just gonna have to look at my face for a second while I configure my AWS CLI. It'll just take me a minute or so. So I'm gonna do AWS configure on the attack box and it's gonna ask me for the access key. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in. It's gonna ask me for the secret access key. So I'm gonna grab that. Default region was US East one. Okay, done. Now I can go back to sharing my screen. So it is an ENI, the security groups are attached. You can get a holistic view by listing all the ENIs in account. So let's go ahead and run this command, AWS EC2 describe network interfaces. See if it works. Okay, cool. So it did work. We have network interfaces here. We have the attachment ID, the instance ID, and then our availability zones. We have a description of them. We can kind of go through here to see if there's anything interesting. We have public IPs, all of that good stuff. I'm guessing we may have to like grep through some stuff and see what's all in here. Oh, oh I was supposed to answer a question. <laughs> List the ENIs in your account. What is the description of the ENI with that IP address? So I would assume, can I do previous command? No? Okay, fine. I won't. Oh my goodness. AWS CLI for some reason breaks the, the attack boxes terminal, so I always have to reset it. But if we do AWS EC2 describe, if I could type right, describe network interfaces, and then if we grep for 10.100.2.79, will that work? Okay, and we want to, what's the question? What is the description? Can we just... I don't know if that works. Maybe we have to grep description first. Otherwise I just have to look at it like a noob. Oh, <laughs> that won't work either. Okay, never mind. You guys let me know what w my bad syntax, what I'm doing wrong there, but we will just go like this then and we will manually find it. So what IP are we looking for? 10.100.2.79, I see it right there. What's the description of the ENI? I don't know. I don't see a description, or is this the description way up here? Maybe that's why Grep didn't find it very well. Yeah, that's probably the reason. All right, I'll get out of that. Yep, and it's broken. We'll reset it. There we go. VPC wormholes, endpoints, and private link. For resources inside of VPC to talk to specific resources outside the VPC, AWS has created two related services, VPC endpoints and AWS private link. These services allow a network or security team to limit or completely disable internet egress in a VPC. VPC endpoints were first introduced with the Amazon S3 service so that machines in a private subnet won't need to leverage a NAT gateway to access S3. NAT gateways have a one gigabyte a second network limitation and can be somewhat expensive. Before VPC endpoints, cloud architects were forced to put machines that require high bandwidth operations on the internet to access S3. VPC endpoints work with S3 and DynamoDB. VPC, M VPC endpoints require a route in the VPC route table. The destination for the route is an abstract representation of the service known as a managed prefix list rather than a specific SATA range. So confusing. AWS is so confusing, y'all. AWS uses prefix lists to map AWS SATA ranges into your VPC. 
These prefix, prefix lists help AWS manage its public IP addresses without requiring customers to change their VPC route tables or security groups. You can see the site arranges for the different services with this command. So I'm just going to copy it, see if it works. And it did. All right, here is the managed prefix list for CloudFront, which is AWS's CDN service. You can see the AWS manages the list of IP ranges currently 44 for you. All right, sweet. VPC endpoints can leverage IAM to limit their use to specific S3 buckets or DynamoDB tables. However, as an attacker, you could add a VPC endpoint as a way to exfiltrate data from a VPC into an S3 bucket you control. Let me read that again. As an attacker, you could add a VPC endpoint as a way to exfiltrate data from a VPC into an S3 bucket you control. Okay. Remember that trick when you get to your AWS attack capstone project. All right, guys. Remember that trick. VPC private link is an ENI in your VPC tied to an AWS service or another AWS customer. It provides a way for AWS or its partners to offer services to AWS customers without requiring customers to allow traffic out to the internet. You can see here in the AWS console all different private link services available. As you see above, there were 177 available AWS services. So it's showing us there at the time of the screenshot. AWS charges a penny per endpoint per hour. If you were to configure all 177 services for an entire month, you're looking at that bill. Quite, quite expensive. You have a VPC endpoint in your VPC. What is the destination in the route table? All right, so if we go over to here, you have a VPC endpoint in your VPC. Do they mean this? I'm kind of confused on, on, on VPCs right now. <laughs> I just haven't worked with them much. Like EC2s make sense to me. S3 buckets make sense to me. I mean, VPC is just networking, software-defined networking, but it's it's confusing to me for some reason. The VPC endpoint route target is VPC. That You'll want to use the console to answer this question. Either route table entry should provide that. Okay. Can I just search for that? Nope, that doesn't do anything. You have a VPC endpoint in your VPC. What is the destination in the route table? Like, why would that not be in VPCs? You know what I mean? AWS, yo. I can't wait till I'm done with this pathway and I can just go back to like regular, like hack the box machines. I always feel so lost on AWS, even going through this. And maybe what I honestly need to do is just set up my own lab. Like I've set up EC2s and things like that, and uh, even configured machines in AWS for me to attack for fun, but none of this kind of thing where I'm messing with VPC. It's like maybe I should create my own like version of try hack me with a VPN and stuff with a VPC. Your VPCs. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Do I need to go to endpoints? Hey, okay. Maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You have a VPC endpoint in your VPC. What is the destination in the route table? Okay. So here are my route tables. There's two of them. What is the destination in the route table? This? Is this the destination? All right. What is the service name for the VPC endpoint? Why didn't you ask me that a while ago? Is it this? No. The service. What is the service name for the VPC endpoint? What's the hint? The answer can be found in the VPC endpoints council. Okay. Service name. Oh, there it is. Boom. All right. More VPS confusion. DNS in a VPC. AWS has several services that can provide DNS inside your VPC. By default, instances in the VPC will use the Amazon provided DNS server. 
that DNS server is always at the base of the VPC IPv4 network range plus two. So if your VPC CIDR is 192.168.15.024, then the default DNS server will be that. The Amazon DNS server will resolve all public DNS entries. You can also create a private Route 53 hosted zone and attach that to the VPC. Route 53 is Amazon's hosted DNS service. Freaking, of course it is. Route 53 is a highly available global service with advanced health checks and failover capabilities. We'll discuss, we'll discuss Route 53 in more detail in a future module. For now, the critical concept is to know you can set up private DNS entries. Um, Undeclared said, is there a Discord for this? Yeah, dude. Good question. Let me drop a link to the Discord over in the chat. Grab the link here. Pull up. Uh, wrong, wrong window. Here we go. There you go. It is uh, the Work Smarter Discord. And one one thing that stands out from the Work Smarter Discord, would encourage all of you to join it. We host meetings every Monday evening at 9 p.m. Central Time, all about goal setting in, in IT and cybersecurity. And we just encourage you to answer three questions in that meeting. What did you accomplish this past week? What are your specific learning goals for this upcoming week? And did you accomplish your previous week's goals? If not, what changes do you need to make to your discipline, to your schedule, all of that? So if you're looking for a community of people just to encourage you and to be uh, noobs together in this this massive cybersecurity field come join would love to have you i am one of the admins there all right where was i at uh aws has oh no down here okay the vpc dns server can also be configured to answer requests from other networks including on-prem networks and a forward request to on-prem dns servers DNS is another lateral movement path where compromise of the cloud can lead to the compromise of the corporate on-prem network. So one way to break in, to turn an external pen test into an internal pen test. One of my friends said, uh, Amoeba Man, who's actually on staff with Try Hack Me, and we've created some content together, he told me, hey, if you're good enough, every external pen test is ultimately an internal pen test. You can configure the Route 53 Resolver DNS firewall and Resolver query logging to CloudWatch logs, I hate AWS's names, as a protection measure. The DNS firewall, I mean, at least that name somewhat makes sense, allows you to configure which DNS domains the instances in your VPC and machines on-prem that leverage the Route 53 Resolver are allowed to query or not allowed to query. The DNS firewall serves as a mitigation mechanism for DNS exfiltration attacks. DNS query logs will enable you to feed the DNS activity of your Route 53 resolver to your security information and event management or SIM for additional threat analysis. Many of these advanced Route 53 features have additional costs, of course, and you should realize when you're incurring charges for security features. Your VPC is configured to send DNS logs to the log group VPC Resolver Logs. You can view the DNS entries from the CloudWatch Logs Council. Let's just copy this link. You can search the entire log group in the upper right corner with the orange search box. Okay. I don't like having a bunch of tabs open. Some of you do because you guys are insane, but I don't. So we can search via what would it say? You can view blah blah. You can search the entire log group in the upper right with the orange search log group. Hmm. Maybe right here. It's not upper right. Maybe it's because my window's small. What is the IP address of that entry? Okay. Can I just like go like that? Nope. Okay, that doesn't work. Actions. Nope. Do I need to make it big? Nope, there's a create log group. Is that what it's talking about? Nope. Do I need to click this? Maybe I need to click this first. Search log group. Hey, that's what I need to do, I think. Let's throw it over to the side. Search log group, and if we start typing there, press enter to search. Hmm. Oh, it's loading events. Maybe it takes a second. No event found, fantastic. Route 53, am I in the Route 53 council? No, maybe I'm not. Let's copy that, actually. I'm in the wrong area, I think. Okay, now I am in the Route 53 council. We have one hosted zone, what's this? VPC room, okay, I don't see task six. What is the IP address of that in the Route 53 council? I don't know. You guys see what I'm missing? 
Oh, do I need to check the domain or something? Maybe I need to maybe I need to check the domain there. No. I guess it's like checking availability for his own. So like, is that a website? Who has hacksmurder.com? Oh, it's a park domain. It's just cat. All right. Domain's a park. Someone else has it. I'm not going to buy it anyways. We could get hacksmurder.org, hacksmurder.info, hacksmurder.ninja. <laughs> uh, anyways, where the frick is this answer? What is the IP address for the entry in the Route 53 Council? I don't know. I'm in the Route 53 Council, I think. We have one hosted zone, which is this one. Oh, here's some records. Ooh, okay. Task six. Hey, that is the SS SSRF like metadata link, isn't it? Beautiful. Within a VPC, there are multiple ways of gathering security telemetry. Te T telemetry telemetry is how you say that vpc flow logs are like their cousin netflow in that they log the packet headers but not the contents of the packet the flow log service can send the resulting logs to cloudwatch logs or an s3 bucket the latter is cheaper and provides a multi-account multi-regional approach by allowing enterprises to log to a central s3 bucket got it each field has a specific meaning as defined here the first field so this right here is the flow log version number, which will always be two if you're using the defaults. Next is the AWS account and the ENI identified, which I think is that. After that is the source and destination IP address, followed by, uh, oh, the source and destination IP address, followed by the, oh, I lost where I was at. Followed by the source, okay, and destination port. Got it. Six represents the protocol number. 21 is the number of packets. 7010 is the number of bytes. The last four are the start and end times of the flow in Unix epoch time, the action accept or reject, and the log status. Usually okay. In 2019, AWS introduced VPC traffic mirroring. Traffic mirroring acts as a network traff on a per ENI basis and is useful for deep packet inspection. There are several limitations on where you can route the mirrored traffic. You need to have layer three route from the source ENI to the traffic mirror target. Okay, source A traffic mirror to the traffic mirror destination. Source B to that. DNS logs, part of CloudWatch as discussed in the previous task, provide Telemetry takes me a while around what query machines in the v in your VPC are making. Amazon Guard Duty is a threat detection service. It leverages AWS threat intelligence and machine learning to detect threats. For network threat detection, Guard Duty uses the VPC flow logs and DNS logs. Go visit the CloudWatch logs page. All right, let's do it. What is the name of the log group with VPC flow logs? I don't know. What is the name of the log group? So let's click a log group with a VPC flow logs. This one. Hey, okay. Undeclared said, is this an interactive tutorial test as part of official AWS or something specific you're doing? So this is actually part of the attacking and defending pathway by try hack me. It's a business exclusive, and then on top of that, it costs quite a bit of money to have access to, but they gave me access for a month so I could stream some of the content. So that's what this is. A lot of it's theory, but then like in a previous stream, it was like a challenge room, where it's more like an AWS CTF. So right now we're going through some theory. The next one is probably a challenge room would be my guess. All right, AWS provides several ways to connect to VPCs. 
As an attacker, it is helpful to know the multiple ways to move from the cloud to on-prem network, cloud to ground, and between different VPCs, cloud to cloud. There is also a method for end user access via an AWS managed service called Client VPN. Cloud to ground connectivity. For enterprise customers, AWS provides an interconnection service called Direct Connect. At least that name makes sense. For companies with racks at specific data centers, AWS will literally run a fiber line from their cage to your router, giving you a dedicated link to the VGW in your VPC. Remember the gateway. Bandwidth of the link could range from 1 gigabyte per second to 100. Customers can share these fiber lines across multiple VPCs and multiple AWS accounts in the org. There's also the AWS Site-to-Site -Site VPN for smaller orgs that don't need the level of bandwidth or latency Direct Connect provides. This service will initiate an IPSEC, or Internet Protocol Security Tunnel, from AWS to your on-prem router or firewall. With AWS Site-to-Site -Site VPN, you first configure a customer gateway, which defines the endpoint AWS Site-to-Site -Site VPN will connect to. You then must create a VPN connection that links the customer gateway with a virtual private gateway. Okay, so here's AWS. Virtual Private Gateway, our VPN connection to our customer gateway or on-prem network. So if we can compromise that, we can jump from the cloud to like AD, for example. Both Direct Connect and Site to Site VPN require a route in the VPC routing table. The on-prem networks need a target destination of the VPC's VGW, their gateway, to route the traffic. From an attacker's perspective, this is a great way to pivot from the cloud to on-prem. From a defender's perspective, you want to ensure that all site-to-site -site VPNs or direct connects terminate at a firewall and set least privileged firewall rules. From a compliance expert standpoint, it's important to note that while site-to-site -site VPNs encrypt the traffic, since it's using IPSEC, direct connect links are not encrypted as the traffic leaves your cage on its way to AWS's cage. But of course, it'd be kind of hard to listen to that. Cloud-to-cloud -cloud connectivity. Many companies adopt a multi-account strategy to separate their development and production environments and limit the blast radius across development teams. When different teams need to communicate with each other's VPCs, AWS provides two means. Number one, VPC peering. Now, VPC peering is a direct one-to-one -one method of allowing VPC traffic to go from one VPC to another inside AWS's network abstraction layer. Peering VPCs can reference each other's security groups. VPC peering works both across accounts and across regions. These features allow customers to replicate data to a disaster recovery setup that a development team should set up in different accounts and regions. VPC peering only works if the VPCs in question do not have overlapping side or ranges. VPC peering requires an entry in the VPC route table for the peered VPC side or range. The destination target for the route is the VPC peering endpoint. Okay, so here's the AWS region. Here is our peering connection, and we are connecting these different instances from the VPC1 to VPC2. One essential concept related to VPC peering is that routing is not transitive with VPC peering. If VPC A has peered to VPC B and VPC P has peered to VPC C, try saying that three times fast. There is no network path for a machine in VPC A to talk directly to an IP address in VPC C. The machine in VPC A would have to talk to a device in VPC B, which could then forward to VPC C. Gosh, the same transitive routing limitation applies to VPN and direct connect connections. I got it. I mean, it's that's basic kind of pivoting is how I would picture it. If you, you know, for example, let's say you're an external attacker, you breach a web server, the web server is dual homed and has a connection to the internal environment. You could use something like chisel to then use that web server kind of as your pivoting point, kind of a similar concept, at least how it works in my head and the way they're describing it. AWS Transit Gateway was intended to solve the management of VPC connections by creating an inter VPC router. Rather than requiring direct peering connection between each VPC that needs to pass traffic, the Transit Gateway allows all of them to interconnect and supports direct connect and site-to-site -site VPN. Okay. Client VPN. One final VPC service attackers and defenders should be aware of is AWS Client VPN. Client VPN is best described as bypass the corporate VPN and access controls as a service. It allows anyone with privileged access to an account to set up their own AWS managed OpenVPN service. Customers can fi configure client VPNs to use three different methods of authentication, shared certificates, 
AWS SSO or AWS's managed Microsoft AD. In each case, the controls for MFA, identity management and audit logging are no longer under the control of central IT, but are managed by the team running the AWS account. This makes client VPN a potential security and compliance risk if not configured properly. All right. Can you find the IP address of the customer gateway for the VPN defined in your account? Probably not. <laughs> Can you find the IP address of the customer gateway for the VPN defined in your account? Okay, let's go back out to home. And if we go to, can we just search for VPN? We're gonna open all of these. Well, we'll open these two. No client VPNs, no VPN connections. There is none. Let's, let's go. Um, maybe if we do, maybe this would work. Okay, no. Okay, no. Pegasus said, try hack me is interesting. Do you have to pay to get access to the content you're seeing? Yeah, and it's crazy expensive. Um, they gave me access just so I could stream it. But one free alternative, guys, is Cloud Goat. If you've ever heard of Cloud Goat, this is actually created by the firm I work for. Uh, Cloud Goat, the scenarios are very similar to what, what Try Hack Me is doing. At least they're challenge scenarios, except for this is free. And you can do it in your own free tier AWS account. And these scenarios cost almost no money as long as you destroy them when you're done with them. Each one of these has a walkthrough that goes with it. And you can also learn AWS pen testing with Cloud Goat. I'll drop a link over in the Twitch but it's completely free and like i said it covers many of the same scenarios from what i can see and i have a playlist on my youtube channel so if you go to my youtube i will drop that link one more time tube.com that's just my name i have a playlist where i go through the vast majority of these cloud goat scenarios and so i think you'll enjoy it so if you don't have access to the try hack me one check out cloud goat uh the only downside is you have to do have to set up your own environment but uh, there's a video, if you search Rhino Security Labs on YouTube, I led an entire workshop helping people create their first free tier AWS account and launching their first Cloud Goat scenario. So it'll take a little more time because you have to set up your own environment, but then it's free and you can learn AWS pen testing through, through Cloud Goat. So check it out. So you can tell, like I said before, I'm still also a noob at AWS. Uh, Rhino is known for AWS pen testing, but like I said, I just do web app pen testing right now. I'm an associate pen tester, which just means, yo, I'm a noob. I've only been pen testing for like nine months. There are no VPN connections. I don't get the question. What am I missing? Can you find the IP address of the customer gateway for the VPN to find in your account? Well, it would appear that there is no VPN defined in my account. Guys, what am I missing? Chat? Do you guys see it? What, what should I check? We're a team. Teamwork makes dream work, but I'm lost. Since it says there's no VPN defined in my account, I don't understand what I'm supposed to be looking for. Let's try this. Oh, maybe this? Hey, what is the routing target prefix for the VPC peering connection? What's the hint? Include the dash in your answer. Now that was definitely a confusing question since it says there's no VPNs defined in my account, but oh well, what is a routing target prefix for the VPC peering connection? I don't freaking know. Uh, 
Okay, that seems like the command would work. Is it AWS EC2 describe VPC peering connections? <sighs> Why? Let's check out the AWS documentation. Oh, for an older version. Why would that not come up with the answer? What is the routing target prefix for the VPC peering connection? How can when I describe VPC peering connections, it says there's no VPC peering connections? I'm so, I'm so confused on this. I mean, not CLI. I wanted the council I meant. So, why the heck is Bing my default search engine, first of all? Let's begin with that. Uh, what was I doing? VPC peering connection AWS console. So, view your VPC peering connections. Open the console. Okay. There, I'm there, same spot. And the navigation pane, choose peering connections. Frick, that doesn't exist. Okay, I guess it does exist. <laughs> uh, but it says zero. What? Guys, my next stream is just gonna be hack the box, like, the classic, we're going to pick a machine and hack the box, and we're going to go into it blind, and we're going to hack it. I, this this is too frustrating for me. What is the routing target prefix for the VPC peering connection? There's not a freaking VPC peering connection. Am I wrong? Maybe this is part of the machine that was broken. Create one? That's a good idea. Do you think it's like the default? It says like for the VPC peering connection. It sounds like it's a VPC connection that's made. Create. There is no other... Maybe this is a standard prefix. I don't, I can't understand Bing. Freaking Bing. What is a routing target prefix for the VPC peering connection? It wouldn't be PCX because that doesn't fit that. Oh, thank you, Trusted Bagel Twitch. I'm still I'm still under the impression though, if anyone here from TriHack Me is watching, this definitely makes it sound like there is a VPC peering connection in my AWS account and uh and it's not. 
wrap up now that we've learned about vpcs you're ready for the next challenge finish this room and move on to apply what you've learned in exercise manipulating vpc to exfiltrate data i'm just going to finish this room for now um it is 1106 p.m where i live and i have to work work in the morning so i'm planning guys i'm probably streaming again tomorrow night we'll see if my kids and everything go to bed at a reasonable time um, but if I stream tomorrow night, honestly, I think I'm going to take a break from this pathway and we are just going to take a random box from hack the box, break out the good old Cali and just hack stuff because that's much more enjoyable to me than going through like these long, uh, scenarios and tutorials, although it's helpful. So I still plan on recording all these modules, but I'm getting kind of burnt out on them. I just want to hack stuff. <laughs> I want to do CTFs not not read through all this text and go through uh these kinds of things so we will see uh tomorrow night hopefully i'll be back you know if i am on it'll be around 10 p.m central time that's just the only time i can stream once i get my kids and everything down for bed for the night and and we might just pick a random hack the box machine and we might maybe we'll check out their new guided mode i made a youtube video about that but hack the box now has a guided mode for their easy machines which in hack the box easy machine is not easy but it makes it feel a little more like try hack me a little more guided a little less like punching your screen inducing so we'll see but hey guys really do appreciate you uh taking the time to hang out for those of you who joined from the raid earlier hey thank you for staying around and learning aws with me hopefully you learned something through it learned something from from my frustration and make sure you come back make sure you subscribe to me on youtube and and would love to connect with you guys further join me on discord if you haven't but anyways ladies and gentlemen thank you for being here have a good evening i will catch you guys in the next one see ya